What up and welcome back to another Malazan Book of the Fallen video. This time we're doing something different. I'm kind of riding shotgun on this thing where we're going to have some Malazan veterans and some Malazan newbies trying to convince folks about why this is something that you should consider diving into. So with that, it's a, an exciting collaboration that I, again, get to ride the coattails on and, and I'm going to turn it over to Alan of uh of the library of alexandria to uh take it away okay so hey guys so this is just kind of uh, the, the brainchild of the four of us where we're trying to um so the, so the three of them have, have have finished the series and really really they they love it and um there's just so many they just talk about it with such passion about just this and erickson's work itself and I know that there's a lot of barriers to entry that, that or seem to be barriers uh, uh, to entry to the Malazan series. And I'm, I'm pronouncing it wrong. I'm not pronouncing it the way he, uh, Erickson pronounces it. So just forgive me. They'll pronounce it right. Um, but so I, I'm going to be learning, hopefully, as much as you guys are in, in the fact that I want to know what, what it is that I might be not seeing. So I'm going to kind of like we asked in, um, in the Shell Space Discord for some questions, as well as my own kind of issues that I uh, perceive when I when I'm reading the books and uh, we're just gonna kind of talk about those and address those to see if it's if Malazan is something that you want to start um, because I, I think there's a great story in there it's just is it how difficult it is it to you know find said story so um, I think we're gonna talk about uh, kind of where we are in our Malazan journey um, so I'm Alan um, I this is actually my fourth time trying to finish the series. I am on the final book of the main 10. Um, the first time I read the, I read the first book stopped in the middle of the second book. The second time I made it into the third book and stopped. The third time was the big one where I made it all the way to Reaper's Gale book seven, finished it and then started book eight and didn't, didn't get it done. And now I have finished book nine and I have to read book 10 and then I will be concluded with the main series. Now there are some side books by his, um, uh, like graduate roommate, D&D partner, um, Ian Esselmont. I've read two of those as well. So I, um, I've read some of the side stuff also, but that is where I am currently. Who wants to go next? I'll go. Uh, right. so, hello, my name is Andy Smith. Uh, I just, uh, well, I'll go back a little bit. Uh, in classic Malazan fashion, I first learned about the series in my D&D gaming group. Uh, one of my uh, close friends, Jim, if you're out there watching, uh, just started talking about this series that he was reading. And funny enough, I remember this conversation. He really emphasized what he called a zombie army that was taking over a continent, which in retrospect, I don't think was the best way to describe uh, Malazan to someone. But it intrigued me. And so I picked up Gardens of the Moon. And I actually did the classic read Gardens of the Moon, started uh, Dead House Gates, and sort of like my momentum slowed, and I got busy and then just never came back to it. And then uh, a couple of years after that, I picked it up again. I had never, I, I had kept my copy on my bookshelf, and I was like, you know what, I should give that another try. I really liked most of it. And then I loved it this time through. Uh, I completely fell in love with it and was really sad that there weren't more discussions of it on BookTube. And so uh, when the world became infected, um, I decided, hey, I'll start a YouTube channel that's talking about it. This is before even I knew about Iskar. Um, and yeah, so that's how I started my booktube channels out of my love for Malazan. I, it's my favorite series um, ever since I have read Lord of the Rings when I was in fourth grade. I've never had a new favorite series. This is the first thing that's ever happened to me uh, in, since then. I, I just love this series and want to talk about it as much as possible. So that's where I am at. Phil, I'll kick it to you. All right, so uh, I'm Philip Chase. And uh, let me just say what a pleasure it is to be here uh, with my colleagues and friends from BookTube. Uh, Professor. Really awesome. I'm, I'm really happy to be having this discussion with you guys. And uh, so my Malazan, I'm also, Alan, I'm going to mispronounce it too occasionally. I, I'm trying to uh, reform myself here. But uh, my Malazan journey began probably, I'd say, a couple of years ago. I, I just we went into it cold. I had no idea what it was. I just sort of heard this is a, an interesting fantasy series. So I, I, I read it and I wish I had done some research. Actually, what I wish was that Andy had made his, uh, 
his postmodern <laughs> video two years ago. What's wrong with you, you slacker, Andy? Sorry. So, yeah, no, that, by the way, that is an awesome video. Check it out. I've seen it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I didn't understand a lot of things as I was reading it. And I knew it was brilliant. And I thought, this guy can really write. But there are some things I just don't get. So, Alan, I'm actually... I mean, I might be closer to you than, than you think um, in terms of where I am in my evolution here. I decided that I needed to reread it, but that I wanted to read everything else that Erickson had done and Esselmont so that I would have a, a better grip on the Malazan world. So I've actually already read uh, the, Car the Carcanus trilogy or the two books that have published in it so far. And I started reading Ian Esselmont's uh, Path to Ascendancy. So that's kind of where I am. I've read the, the main series, the 10, uh, one time, and I, I kind of thought, wow, this is brilliant, but I really need to do this again to, to kind of get a grip on this. And the more I read, particularly when I read the Carcanus trilogy, I feel like I've made some breakthroughs in terms of understanding what Erickson is, is up to. So hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about that. So I'm going to turn it over to Iskar. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, and I'm also just very flattered and honored to be here. Even though this is showing up on my channel, I'm like very much huge fans of, of you guys. And, and so just to even be invited to, to participate is huge because I think for me, I, you know, my journey is that I've read all the books. I read them once, I think probably, I want to say maybe like, maybe even eight, nine years ago, something like that. I had just uh, watched the first season of, I never read fiction before in my life, like until I was wow. probably like 30 years old. I watched the uh, first season of Game of Thrones and I was like, oh my gosh, this is cool. And then I was like, I didn't realize that there was something I could get out of fiction. I'm a data nerd as my like daytime job. And so I was always like, man, if I'm going to waste my time reading, I'm going to read something that's gonna make me smarter or something. I didn't realize there was this whole other thing that could happen by, that reading fiction does make you smarter, which I think is a whole uh, video. But be that as it may, I stumbled onto to fantasy and then I like consumed all of that stuff and I wanted to know what classical fantasy was. So I went back and read some of the early, you know, things that are considered classic fantasy and Le Guin and, uh, and Lord of the Rings and stuff like that. And, uh, and then just went from there. I was kind of pissed having to wait for, for the next uh, a Song of Ice and Fire book. So I was waiting for, um, you know, a dance with dragons at that time and going, you know, what's uh, what's going on? Waiting, <laughs> waiting, waiting. Then we got it and I read it. And then I was like, oh my gosh, now I'm ready for the next one. That took me like a month to read. And now it's been many, many years, almost a decade since. And so I was like, went on Google, like, what's a completed series that I can pick up? And right at that time, like, uh, I think the chain God had come out. So I was able to just burn right through all of that. I have them as one big giant Kindle book. Nice. I read all those. And then I read the, uh, I read them actually, again, right after that, because I just kind of I didn't understand what I was reading and I was like, I just want to, you know, I'm very much like, and, and honestly, I think the, the other books that I've read are very much destination driven, right? It's not about the journey. It's about like, does uh, light conquer dark and all this stuff. And, and so I was like, where do we get to that part where it's like, you know, where the hero comes out and does the thing where they chuck the ring in the thing, um, <laughs> you know, and that never, never happened. And that's so I like, I got to read this again. And I went back and even the second time I burned through it too quick. And then I went through the ice stuff and went through Carcanus and I read some other stuff, Hob and everything. And only really on the reread have I appreciated how, how deep it is. And this third time just, or, you know, fourth, depending on what specific book is, you know, just being able to mine the nugget, it gets better and better and better. So, so that's why I don't totally hate on, uh, on people who are skeptical about diving in because you don't, you can't fully appreciate it until at least till you get to the end of the, the 10 books at first. I, um, I, I had a similar thing waiting for the next Game of Thrones book. Like, cause I, had, I, you know, I had the series, I'd read uh, D and D books, like Forgotten Realms books forever. And then, you know, some kind of scattered ones and then waiting for the next Game of Thrones. I'm like, I need to read something else. So I, my first tried 
in 2008 is when I started my Malazan journey that I have not completed yet. <laughs> so it's <laughs> but soon. a long ride. It's indeed. I soon should, indeed. I, I forgot to add one key uh, part of my Malazan story. And that is um, that in my zeal for wanting everyone in the world to read this book, I got my wife to read Gardens of the Moon. And she is, a, she's a vivacious reader, way faster than me. I mean, she reads like a book every three days. So, so like, definitely knows how to read a book. Uh, she read Gardens of the Moon and absolutely hated it. I mean, my favorite person <laughs> in the world just hated it. Um, and she's even read some fantasy before and, and liked it. She's not a huge fantasy reader, but that, and so let that be said that I, I can understand there are good people in the world who don't like it. Just <laughs> my wife would move on it in this conversation. Yeah. Um, so before we jump into it, um, just everybody at home understand that um, there's going to be some disparity um, in pronunciation on, uh, with like the races of the world and uh, character names. Um, unless Erickson has said it, uh, it's really kind of, there's not really a pronunciation guide. So if they've heard Erickson pronounce it and they're pronouncing it right, just ignore me. I'm going to just pronounce it how I do it in my head. So I my number one source of comments on my channel is my incorrect pronunciations. Even though he has said it, I'm still gonna say it wrong, so don't worry. Absolutely, okay, cool. I was gonna say the exact same thing. Cool. Like at least half my comments, no matter what I say, is that I'm saying it wrong. I literally, I thought, I thought that Ganos Paran was the, was impossible to have multiple pronunciations of. I guarantee you, not one of you three says Ganos Paran. Nope. Yeah. Yep. See? <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> what I thought was the easy. Do, do we all at least say fiddler? Fiddler. Okay. <laughs> it's French, I believe. Fiddler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. So I'm gonna. I'm. Let's go ahead and start this with. Um. Because I think this is a really good place to start. This is uh from from the Shell Space Discord. <laughs> they asked, "What is Malazan even about? Is it a quest fantasy? Is it um like?" Is it a kingdom fantasy? It was, they, they've heard that it is more about ideas than it is plot and characters. So that's part one. But the second part was, what is it even about? And I think that's valid. Like, I think that's a valid concern, question on what is it about? So I, I'm going to take this first because I think I understand the depth slightly less than you guys. So to me, Malazan to me, and the stuff that I really like about it the most is it, it is following the Malazan army, which is some, which is really kind of a quasi Roman army. I mean, and I compare it to Rome just because they've taken over, uh, they've provincified everything near them, just like the Romans. And you know, we, but but it's not it's not just men. Women are, are treated equally in the military and everything. And there's sorcerers and stuff. And it's really about. Um, at least the first the first few books are about the uh, the conquest of these the suppression of a rebellion in a, in a desert subcontinent and the conclusion of a conquest on a different continent. And that's really the first half of it. And so you're really following the military and that's what I really like. That's what drew it to me and kept me reading. Now, it goes places from there, but that is what I would tell someone who is beginning it, especially if I knew, if they, liked, especially if I knew they liked military fantasy, um, who wants to add something. Yeah, I would say there's two two levels to this. There's the plot level, which I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. I would I would describe it as a a story that's about both the kind of internal dynamics of an empire and then the external kind of struggle that they're having with the rest of of the world on a kind of thematic level, I would say, you know, that there's a a lot of kind of um empathy and compassion. I would say that that one of the things I, I think that he's trying to do is get us to, or is to hold a mirror up to ourselves and get us to, to think about a lot of the things that are that are happening out there and, and, and uh, kind of grapple with them without giving you straight up answers. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely agree with Iskar there about the theme driven nature of the Malazan Book of the Fallen. And I think you hit it, the nail on the head there. Uh, it's about empathy and compassion primarily. If you had to say one sentence about the whole series, I think that would probably be the one. And I think one of the things that maybe throws people, and definitely through me anyway, was how the narrative is not what you expect. And I think, Iskar, you were talking about that before. It's not character driven, like probably the majority of fantasy these days is character driven. 
It's not plot driven even so much as theme driven. And I think what people expect when they read a fantasy is that there's some hero or at least a group of people that they follow along with through the whole thing and that they sort of identify with and that that group somehow or other is gonna triumph and they're gonna feel good at the end of it. That's, that's not what Erickson delivers in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. I think that might actually be why so many people complain, I think mistakenly, about the characters in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. Erickson is a brilliant character writer. Mm -hmm. I would dispute with anyone who would disagree with that statement, really, because uh, he really knows what he's doing. I think you all know, we've talked about the, uh, the Facebook post, the famous Facebook post that so many people were calling a rant. And I don't think it was a rant at all. Actually, I think he had some amazing advice for character writing in there. And it was also pretty humorous if you read through the whole thing. But he's a brilliant character writer. He just doesn't choose to keep the same character from the beginning of the story chronologically all the way to the end. Characters appear where they need to appear and they support the theme. And they're part of this vast world of lots and lots of characters where, you know, I, in my Malazan video, I compared it to, um, you probably have all gone to a, a theater or something and seen, uh, I live near New York City and sometimes I like to go to the American Museum of Natural History where there's this IMAX theater and they show these movies, one about the universe and, and our place in the universe. Mm -hmm. and we're this tiny, tiny, tiny little planet next to the sun and, and of course that's part of this humongous galaxy and that's part of this amazing universe. And that's kind of the feeling I have when I read Malaz in Book of the Fallen is you get this feeling of just awe and wonder, but also the smallness of the individual. This is not about the individual. And I think that's something that I understood only when I read uh, the Carcanus trilogy. And he pretty much says in there, there are no individual stories. So uh, that's a long way of saying, yeah, I agree with you, Iskar. <laughs> God bless. Yeah, I since I'm the postmodern guy, I think I'll just throw sort of the hat into that ring um, in the sense of, Erickson is doing purposefully a lot of very unique things in the Malazan world. And I'm getting away from the initial question. So I think to expand a little bit more on like what it means that it's about theme, like someone asks, what is Malazan about? I would tell them various things depending on who I'm talking to, obviously. But if uh, someone who's watching this video, I would say it is about how do you actually fight suffering and evil in this world to be successful? Um, and the answer to most, the, the answer that most books would give you to that question is like, we must do one quest and fulfill it. Um, and I think what Erickson wants to do is say, there are so many situations where there is no quest that can be completed to make this better, where there is hopelessness or where it will take immense sacrifice or where the, all of these, there's so many different applications in the real world of what is the, the reaction to evil that we need to have to be successful mm -hmm. and to form a better world. We can't just have that good versus evil question. Um, and so he chose to write in what I would call a postmodern way, which is there's not really an overarching story like those guys were saying where you know we need to bring the ring to a volcano. It is, we are going to be in this world for a little while, and um, we are going to show you different ways that this can be fought, and in some situations where people have fought it the wrong way and lost, or where odds are too much and are overcome, and so are very honest with the world as it is. Um, and that's what I think postmodernism does at, at its best. It's a fancy word, in my viewing, for dealing with the world as a broken, separated place, and yet trying to find your own place within it. Um, maybe I'm getting too philosophical here, but I think that's what Erickson is offering to us. And I will say by the end of those 10 books that are all over a thousand pages, I think, or at least most of them, uh, it is gonna be brought together. Uh, the 10th one especially does a lot of work to sort of communicate what I just communicated much more clearly with details from the series. Um, but it takes a long time to get there. It's not like, you know, there's going to be a Council of Elrond as the fourth chapter. Um, yeah, so that that's my effort to kind of explain a little bit more of that. Okay. Um, so, we, I have a, 
Uh, we jumped around a lot, and that's fine. We're going to come back to all these points because Philip jumped ahead to um, talking about Erickson's uh, Facebook thing and the <laughs> character thing. Because I mean, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, because I know this because I've I talk to people. Erickson himself can present a barrier to entry because people don't like him or the way he comes across. So. Really quickly, before we get into that, I want to address um, what you guys were saying about the thematic stuff, and um, it's not these people you follow uh, through the whole thing on these quests. I think that people, if you're looking for that, I think there is things you can enjoy from Malazan. I think that's why I like the books and the parts that are my favorite are my favorite, like the Chain of Dogs, the Siege of Kapistan, the uh, yeah. the Bone Hunters, um, just the Bridge Burners themselves. I think all of that is kind of like, you know, the group of people we've been with performing some form, some mission, right? If not a quest, some mission. And those are the parts that I latch onto that I, that I like the most, I think. So I think that is in there. So I think the issue is and I'll come back to this in a minute, like what happens in between those things. And I think that's where all of that, um, all the stuff that, that I might be missing or a first time reader might be missing if, cause I, I struggle with, with, with theme and um, just kind of more abstract things uh, than, than some people. Uh, my wife is, my wife is, she's a, she's a theme goddess. She is, she's, she was an English major, so she's mastered that um, before she was a music major. But um, so, so I think there is, there is a lot to like um, even if you do just like the, you know, the group of people performing a mission, there's a lot of awesome stuff. Dust of Dreams that I just finished that I talked about right before we started this meeting. Um, but so let's just go ahead and skip to Erickson himself. So, well, can I add real quick something to what yeah, you just go. said? Go, go. Cause I wanted to say this and I forgot on top of all the flowery philosophical stuff I just had, Erickson has like the best fantasy elements and world and imagery that I've ever read. Like, Dragons, probably the best I've ever read. His magic system is so unique, like nothing you've ever seen. All the cities have unique and true elements. As probably most people know, he's an anthropologist. So he really brings a lot of energy. Like I was just watching a interview with him today where someone asked him about his magic system and he started talking about Central Asian shamans and how that influenced how he talked about magic. And so like all, all, this, all the elements of his world as well are so cool. And like you said, the way he writes action and, oh, and, yeah. and, and the different ways that he describes military techniques. I don't even like really like military fantasy that much, but the way it's presented is so cool. So there are all those elements too. I don't want people to think there, there yeah. isn't like just some super awesome stuff that happens. Yeah, and um, I would add, he writes, I think he writes military battles some of the best I've ever seen. Like he's up there, right up there with Bernard Cornwell, who is a historical fiction writer um, who writes about, he has a Saxon series, but I've read his Napoleonic Wars uh, books and it's, he's just describing Napoleonic War battles and it's brilliant. And Erickson is right up there. Like I love when people are at war in the Malazan books. I struggle when they're not at war. I'm not a peacetime reader apparently because I love military fantasy. So, so Erickson, <laughs> when I read his thing, his, his, because Philip said people call it a rant. I, do you see how people can think that he is calling them stupid if they don't like the way he did it? Because he does say, picture the way a baby eats, how you feed a baby and you do this and gradually. So I can understand when people think that he is calling them babies for not understanding the way he does it. And I think there's something to be said, how many grizzled veterans can you write that are different? And how many Talana Mas, how many undead warriors do we really need POVs for, right? Like, I think there is, I think there is something to be said where I completely understand, Philip, what you're saying and what you guys are saying with he, he chooses to write characters differently. I get that. And I, I agree, like with the ones, especially the ones we spend a lot of time with. But I also understand where if you're, especially if you're like a newer fantasy reader or you haven't read something like Malazan before, how you can see that these guys have no personality, right? I mean, it's, as long as it's not Krupp or... Iskral Pust, which ugh, I hate them. I hate them both. But um, <laughs> that makes I, I hate them both. Does that make sense? So, Alan, can I just say one thing about that? I actually don't think 
he's he's treating readers like babies. He's actually treating readers like adults when he's saying, um, you don't need me to give you tons of exposition. You don't need me to hold your hand. You can figure it out. And not only that, but it's actually going to be a better read for you. And I actually completely agree. It's, it's the old, you know, show, don't tell. That's mm -hmm. what that Facebook, Facebook post was. It was just saying, show, don't tell. And I thought he did a brilliant job of it. So I actually read him as, in, in that post at least, as saying, you can handle this and uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to spoon feed you. I'm going to give you some, you know, you're going to have to work a little bit, but it's, you're going to be more invested and it's going to be better read for you. That's how I took it anyway. I got you. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think there's something about the, the kind of meta nature. It's called Malazan Book of the Fallen, right? You're reading about this as a book, as a, as a kind of document of what, what happened and and you're there to figure it out and i agree it's it's kind of like i i always call it like the the big brother of like a wheel of time who's like more badass and smokes cigarettes and rides a harley or something <laughs> but where they don't kind of give you the whole uh backstory and then show you the conflict it's like you're just you just drop into the conflict and you kind of you are ganos Perrin. you are um you know quick ben trying to you know, unravel the plot or whatever. And, and, and so you're, you're in there just like them figuring it out, like as you would, if you were picking up this book and trying to go, okay, here's where we are now. How did we, how did we get here? And, and so I think that that's a, a problematic for people's reading style. Like some people are very much, you know, when do we get to the part like I was, you know, like, and I didn't appreciate it on the first time. Like, when do we get to the part where he cuts his head off and that's it, right? And, <laughs> and, and you never really, you never really get that. And then you get to the end and you're like, okay, so, so what was going on there? And then you have to kind of process and digest. But I love it because I'm, I'm kind of the, the pedestrian Malazan tuber uh, who is like you know you guys are talking about Dickensian themes and um, all this super smart stuff and I always learn so much from watching your videos and then I'm like did you see how they blew all that stuff up and I'm with you I'm with you you know um, but but that's what's cool is is that I think honestly it has something for everyone and I you know you can read it the first time and it's like they were shooting lasers up at that flying mountain and that was gnarly, you know? And then you can like start to just peel back the onion and find <laughs> out like, oh my gosh, there's compassion and empathy in there and there's postmodernism and there's um, Dickensian themes and all these other things that, and so it's got, you know, it's got as much or as little as you want. Don't, don't let Iskar's modesty fool you though. He actually has some pretty awesome analysis in his videos too. Yeah, I would definitely uh, echo that. I would also say one of the, um, uh, I think Philip said this earlier about, he said in the Garcan, it's really, there isn't one overarching story, right? Erickson really believes that. And so the way that he tells the story in the Malazan Book of the Fallen is just by jumping around from different characters and seeing the world from their perspective at that particular time. Um, and sometimes that can be frustrating. Um, so, uh, Sometime, one of the, one, as an example, one of the things that Erickson gets critiqued for is his love stories, um, where uh, I actually don't think he's so bad at love stories. He just prefers them to happen off screen, which I know is very frustrating for some people, but because of the way he tells stories is you're always in the head of somebody seeing what's happening. And so if that somebody isn't, the, isn't you know, one of the two people that are falling in love, they don't have, you know, an intimate connection to what's happening because you're never intimately involved in you know someone's love story if you're not a part of the love that's happening but uh when you get back in the head of the person who is in love then all of a sudden you're feeling the love and people think feel like that's a disconnect but really the way that the story is always going to be communicated to you is through different people's individual stories and you're just kind of jumping in and out of their stories not that you're like hearing this overarching story if that, uh, I hope, hopefully that makes sense, but that's how he chooses to tell the story. And I think that's, it is totally different from any fantasy that I so far have read. Um, yep. I've had, since I've started YouTube and a lot of people have recommended me certain things that they think are a little bit more, uh, Malazan like, but all of the big ones from Lord of the Rings to Brandon Sanderson to Jer uh, Gentleman Bastards, you know, like these series, like they tell things 
in a pretty linear sort of like storyline way, which I, I'm not critiquing, but it's yeah. a different way than the Malazan does it. And so I think that is definitely something to come into with the knowledge of like, don't keep looking for, okay, so what's, what am I following? What's the overall thing? I think it's much more interesting to just kind of be where you are and like read and be interested in what's happening. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and the thing is, I agree with what you guys are saying. Like, and I think, I think this is a case of, I think people have to kind of separate the art from the artist because I think when you guys are saying it, it doesn't sound like you're talking down to me. It doesn't sound like you're talking down to the people watching. I think, I think Steven Erickson himself can come across as prickly to people. Um, and, and I say this because th I feel that way when I listen to him talk sometimes or read what he's posted. And I know other people who do as well, who are like, yeah, why would I want to read something like by, by someone who acts that way? And so I think whether, whether he intends to or not, and whether he does or not, I think some people may perceive him as coming off a little pretentious. And I think I like Malazan anyway. So I think this is a, something where, where you kind of have to separate because for, for example, I read Lovecraft and Lovecraft was a horrible man, like just a terrible, terrible, terrible human being, you know? So I think, I think that if, if uh, the author does come across that way to you, I think that if the stuff that we're saying here sounds interesting to you, that I, I think you just kind of have to just ignore that. Like, and does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think if I could jump in that he's a really empathetic person. Somebody, I forget who, but in my Discord, they said he's a really empathetic person and that he suffers for it. Um, and I think that at, when they said that, I was like, boom, you know, I think a light went off. And I think that he is like that with, you know, critiques of his writing. I, I love and appreciate that he's like kind of a real person and, and fires back and is like, here's why I, I kind of did that and tries to explain what's going on there and stuff. I, I don't, I could see how people get the impression that he's like, this is why I think you should like it, you know? And, and I think there is a defensive uh, kind of note to, to those, um, you know, things that he writes, but I think that it comes from a place of, of trying to, to describe what he does. And I think he's just a, a, a very sensitive person. And I think he, he feels motivated to, or I think that he, feels that he did, you know, wrote the books the way that he did for a reason and wants and wants people to get that. And that is kind of a, a source of frustration when it doesn't uh, uh, come through. But I, I, I just love that he's a guy who's like, here's what I wrote and here's why I wrote it. And I, I, I think that's a cool thing as a reader too, because you can kind of read the books and have your own reaction to them. And then you can kind of see what he, he wanted you to try to get out of them too. And and for better or worse, I think that's a fun exercise to go through as a human being. Yeah, I would, uh, I would, I would throw in if uh, you've like read some essays that he's done, and he do and you don't like how he communicates there. I recommend for people find the podcast Ten Very Big Books. Uh, Iskar is actually on there every once in a while, and they do a interview with him at the end of each uh, book that they're going through. And it's hilarious because if you don't know that podcast, it's three people. Uh, one of which she like doesn't even really like reading as a hobby, but she's just doing it with her <laughs> friends. And so she hates the books for the most part. She's sort of come around or, or come and gone. She hates the books and she'll, t and she'd tell Steven Erickson that in the interview. And he is such a good sport, so much fun. So I think that was sort of my first interaction with him, like as a person, um, cause I didn't read a lot of them. And so since then I've just loved him because I'm reading with his voice, all of these essays. And I think that changes the perception of him, at least for me, cause that's how I uh, got. So I've never gotten that because that was my first interaction with him. And I, I, and now obviously I will say as someone like, who is a small YouTuber, but he like thanked me on my YouTube video. Cause I, I put some love and thought into this. Like I'm really grateful for him that. So at the same time that I agree, like he's very academic and sometimes academics come across as um, snooty. Uh, no offense, Philip. <laughs> uh, not you particularly, just, you know. You know. Um, okay. But, uh, um, I mean, the fact that he took time to, to, you know, look at a small YouTuber's, you know, work and say, hey, thanks for doing this is, I think, pretty cool. I, I would just, yeah, I would second that, Andy. I thought it was just so awesome, the comment that he left on your video, which was fantastic. He also did an interview with one of our fellow booktubers, uh, Books with Brittany, fairly recently. And, you know, it's not a huge channel, 
uh, it's a, you know, it's a pretty good size, a smallish channel, but you know, I thought, how many authors do that, you know? And I actually think he, he's probably a pretty nice guy um, from what I've seen, so yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is literally why we're doing this because Andy, I didn't, I didn't know that about the the podcast and that like, uh, so, and I think a lot of people don't. And so hearing that, like, he's a good sport about the girl who, who freaking hates his books. Yeah. Like, it's really I, I funny. Think, Especially the first one is so funny. <laughs> so I think this is really good for people to know that it doesn't come across because, okay. So let's say you've never read Malazan. All right. Let's say you've never read Malazan, or if you have, you've never heard, you've never read anything like that's that he's written outside of his books, like any book. And the first thing you come across is the Facebook post that was because you watch Daniel Green, which is how most people found out about it. You, you, you come across the Facebook post where he's like, you know, railing it or talking about characters, right? Yeah. You can imagine how that could come across to people if they've never, you know, never heard of him or never read anything by him before. So I think this is really good that you guys are helping to, to I mean, for lack of a better word, humanize what may seem, seem uh, like, like it, you know, is prickly, if you will. Yeah, no, I totally get that. And that essay particularly, um, I think he even says in the introduction that like, you know, this probably isn't a good idea, but I'm gonna throw it out there. And yeah. he is in some ways uh, like subtweeting popular artists or popular authors and how they do character. And so I think that if people think that he's targeting someone specifically they really like, I totally understand that being a turnoff if that's your first, you know, interaction. Cool. Well, well, this was, th this is, I'm so glad we're doing this. This is cool. Let's, so let's move on to some other questions. Um, so um, this is like, if, if you take all the books, like it's like a 25 book series so far, right? And there's another, he's about to, you know, bust out the last uh, or uh, start a new one, start a new trilogy. Um, where do they even start? That's, that's what someone was asking. Like where, how do you not get intimidated by that? Do you start at book one? Because nearly everyone has heard that book one sucks. Like, I mean, just to be blunt, everyone's, everyone has heard that book one isn't very good that, or that it's, that it's really confusing, that it's just inaccessible. Let me use the word inaccessible because I don't hate Gardens of the Moon. Um, but I do agree that it can, I had to read it three times before I finally understood what the crap was going on. And I think, I think Dead House Gates and Memories of Ice does a lot of informing what the crap is going on in Gardens of the Moon. Um, so do you guys think starting with Gardens of the Moon is a, is a good idea? Like, is there... Uh, someone else says, um, to kind of add on to this, is there any kind of primer series that can prepare you for, for Malazan? Like if you like this, you'll, you'll like Malazan because it's, it's maybe similar, but maybe a step further kind of thing. So how do you guys address that? Yeah. So I, I actually just finished reading Dancer's Lament, the first book in Path to Ascendancy. Now I, I want to say first that Erickson and Esselmont both advise reading the books in publication order, which means Gardens of the Moon would be first. But as I was reading Dancer's Lament, I thought to myself, you know, this is a very gentle introduction to the Malazan world. And I was thinking it could be a nice way in for somebody who doesn't feel like getting totally lost. Like, I mean, it just, if Gardens of the Moon just starts out and you got to run to catch up with what's going on. I mean, it's in medias race. It's just, you know, right there. So. I just thought to myself, you know, and I, and I said this in my review of it too, Dancer's Lament, maybe Path to Ascendancy is uh, a, a, just a more gentle way into the Malazan world where you get to know some of the key characters, you get to know the, uh, the landscape a bit, you get to know, uh, you know, some important things, even about how gods work, that sort of thing. So I don't know, maybe uh, Iskar and Andy would disagree with me there, but I actually thought, hey, this could be a nice way to, to, to gently introduce a new Malazan reader. What do you guys think? I'm gonna jump in and do a, a hard right turn and disagree with that. <laughs> and uh, no, I, I I like that that Gardens of the Moon has been so hyped up, honestly, by this point uh, as being such a challenge, honestly, because I think anybody realistically watching this video is a fantasy book nerd and that you're sitting here watching this means that you like fantasy and I think you're gonna handle it. And so for me, I think the negative publicity on Gardens of the Moon 
at this point is a positive because I think there's a lot of people like me who stumbled into fantasy later in life or recently and have gobbled up everything in sight because you've been in quarantine for six months or whatever and you're looking for something and I think you're going to be able to handle it. And so for me, it's almost like a, you know, when someone tells you a movie's really good and then you go there with such high expectations and even if it's really good, it just ends up being okay just because the hype was, was so high. I think you're going to get the opposite thing here where, where gardens of the moon is hyped as being so terrible um, and, and just a dropper, you know, that you just DNF it and leave it in the dust and move on, that people are going to be like, oh, my gosh, this is actually fun. Oh, my gosh, there was this guy with this badass sword, uh, you know, uh, did all this crazy stuff, and it's not going to be as hard as they thought, and then they're going to be pumped to jump into Dead House Gates and Memories of Ice, which really do um, get more kind of, you know, at least Memories of Ice gets more traditional and linear, and I think if they can get through those three, then they'll at least be sucked in to finish, so... Um, I, I, I say go pub, publication order. I still call them the main 10 and I get a lot of flack for that, but I, I view them as the main 10 in the side series, no offense to ice, but um, I, I, I think those really build on the enjoyment after you've, you know, read the main 10. Yeah, I have a video on like introductions to the Melasm universe and, and my thing is kind of the same. Like, don't think that you're getting into a 25 work series because if you Google M Melasm reading order, they will give you the like full 25. And I just don't think that's helpful. That's super intimidating for anyone. Uh, so I would think focus on the main 10 your first time around. And even more than that, if you are a first time reader and you're really skeptical, I would say view the first three, that's going to be Gardens of the Moon, Dead House Gates, and Memories of Ice as a trilogy. Because you can just read those three, walk away, and feel very, very fulfilled. And I think you'll get some good stuff out of it. I think if you really get through those three, you'll want to continue. Because Memories of Vice, I think, is really, really great. Um, and, he, and Erickson starts really hitting his stride about where he wants to end up. Um, but I think that's the least intimidating. Just think, like, oh, it's just a trilogy. Um, and then as a corollary to that, I would also recommend... Uh, don't we are we are we are taught to read books like as i said before for like the plot elements and so you're all like you're taught to read looking for like i have to know everything that's happening because it's all going to come back together right there's going to be a chance where everything comes together and i got to know what's happening or i'm going to miss that don't read Mala uh malazan like that like just read it and enjoy where you're at there's going to be times where you start reading a chapter and you're like i don't know who this person is just keep reading don't like get bogged down in the dramas persona. I don't like Google it. I would just say, just keep reading. If you don't know who it is, and even the chapter ends, you still don't really know who that is, probably you're gonna be fine. Cause the way that uh, Erickson writes is he'll give you another perspective from someone else that'll make that clear eventually. So just keep going. I think momentum is the key in, uh, in Malazan. Just keep, keep reading. I um I think uh like I think what you guys are saying is is absolutely right. But I mean, I would I I don't know how you would stop at three without the seven cities plot line like resolved. Like I would have to read four. Uh, to, but the Gardens of the Moon, the first fifty pages are the hardest. Like when I first read those fifty pages, the Siege of Pale, which is the very first thing um, after the prologue, which doesn't make sense for books to come, um, <laughs> and then the freaking village in Itko Khan, with where everything's dead like it's, it's chapter two like that those two chapters the siege of pale and it and the, the village in it Khan, are the most confusing things before you understand anything about the world they're so not complicated at all once you understand anything about the world but those first 50 pages are rough for a brand new reader I, I they were for me really really challenging um and so but after that after after that and once you start to get kind of your footing in the world um like andy says you're not going to understand everything but you don't need to and you don't feel you do not feel as lost as you do in those first 50 pages you just don't yeah. so if you can get past that and like get into freaking get into Darugistan, like I love being in Darugistan. Uh, the hardest part of Gardens of the Moon is really freaking Krupp. But, um, and then you get to books two and three, and they're, like, like you said, Andy, in, um, in your review of Memories of Ice, it's, ve it's very, like, it's much more focused, and it, it feels, they feel more traditional. Um, and like you just said, Iskar, they, they, they feel more traditional in, um, in, like, the plot is very, very clear. Chain of Dogs, which is in book two, is one of my favorite things 
in yeah. all 10 books. I haven't read book 10, but in, in, in the nine books that I've read, like there's just some of the best stuff in two and three. Uh, because I mean, I, I probably uh, lend myself more to the traditional format um, than you guys. But so, yeah, so I would say stick out those first 50 pages in Gardens of the Moon. And if you don't understand it, like ask someone. And I know that I know that Brittany sometimes says that she reads the chapter descriptions um, on like the Malazan wiki after she reads a chapter just to make sure like uh, she didn't miss anything. And it's just kind of an extra way to kind of synthesize what you read. And I don't think that's a terrible idea at all. I have used that a couple times when I read a particularly chapter a week, like especially later in the books, uh, in the later books where I'm just like, what, what happened? Yeah. You know what I so I think I think that's a that's a, a a valid way to also kind of get some clarity if you're super lost. Agreed. And the, honestly, that's the whole motivation for for my channel. I like doing like all these deep dives and stuff. But I do the chat. I have like a commitment to do the chapter by chapter stuff, just because I think that there, you know, if you look, there's the wiki and the tour reread or read along or I forget what it's called but we needed like a YouTube version of that for somebody to like spend 15 20 minutes and decompress on you know and kind of like be that overnight brain assimilation function where you're like here's kind of what happened and just you know because I think that you know if I could help coach people through those first couple of books you know and and make them realize that because there's so many names and I think you know you have to get I think to book to return of crimson guard to get to somebody named like Kyle right or something why like that Kyle why is this uh, name so Kyle? you're grappling with a lot of learning and just name pronunciation uh you know a lot of cultural stuff that gets thrown at you and and so I think that that stuff can be daunting but it's not like you said once you get past it and you you know in perspective look back it's not it's not that bad so that was the whole motivation is like i i have these side videos that i do for fun they get like no views but the real ones are to like coach people through the first three books so that this you know series doesn't seem as intimidating as as it does because it's not as bad as as what people think okay all right so we're getting down into the last uh questions from the people in the discord and then a couple of my personal ones um so, well, first of all, I want to ask, what do you say to, um, okay, so the other one, this is a question literally from the Discord. I heard he writes pages and pages of buildings, and then I added ruins and history. Um, is that true, and is it super jarring? And I'm just going to kind of tie this in with, like, uh, everyone has heard that it's this really dense kind of inaccessible prose. So how do we address, um, I know that he... I love the fact that he knows what a pot shirt is. All right. Like my students, every time, <laughs> every time I talk about like, okay, the Greeks ostracized, the Athenians ostracized using pot shirts. They're like, don't you mean pot shards? I'm like, no, you think it's pot shard. It's pot shirt. So the fact that he uses pot shirt just makes me so happy. And I love ruins. So the, the stuff about the ruins doesn't bother me. That's one of the, my favorite parts is when they're in seven cities, just looking at all the, the broken crap. Um, so I am probably not the best person to talk about is that jarring because it's not for me. Yeah, it was never jarring for me at all. I love that. I mean, one of the reasons I read fantasy at all is because it, the, for me, my favorite fantasies give a sense of, you know, lost kingdoms and, and, you know, a deep sense of the past layers and layers and layers. And I actually think maybe Erickson does this better than anybody. Uh, but it's just because of his archaeology background, maybe, but it's just brilliant, I think, that uh, you get a sense that this, this is a world that's been lived in for a long, long time, and those layers from the past are relevant to the present. They have, there are repercussions from past events that influence what's going on in the story currently. I just love that stuff. I, I love that sense of, you know, and it gives you a, a a deep sense of just life's fleetingness and, and your place again in the universe is your little, this tiny thing here. And then Erickson's just sense of history and culture and everything really reinforces that. So that's something I love about fantasy period. Tolkien does it, you know, even Brandon Sanderson does it. Uh, who doesn't, you know, uh, the big epic fantasies got to have this 
these layers of the past. And I, Erickson maybe does it better than anybody. What do you guys think? Yeah, I would say, so he's not as descriptive as a lot of, like Tolkien is much more descriptive about scenery and like what's happening that. than Erickson is. Um, I think George R. R. Martin talks more about structure, like actual physical structures and buildings than Erickson does. Now he does talk about those things. Um, I think the thing that he does a lot of is both like talk about the history of some place as well as like people's internal, a lot of times it comes across as monologues, but I think it's just like, cause he's so uh, dedicated to giving you like people's perspectives that sometimes it'll sound like a monologue, but it's just these people's perceptions of the world. He'll get into that a lot. And I think that that's always purposeful. Um, and it's again, just the style that he's choosing to write these books in is that you are getting a lot of different l viewpoints of the world. So I think that's probably what people are getting at in those two things. Cause, and, and like trying to find a way to describe that. Um, Cause I mean, truly like each book, you're probably in upwards of 50 characters, if not more. So like you get this sort of stuff quite a bit. Um, uh, so I think that's probably what people are getting at more than like specifically he's doing too much scenery or too much building or whatever. I think it's that, it's that internal monologue when people are seeing that happens a lot. I enjoy it. If you don't enjoy it, you can maybe like skim some of that or, or ch choose you know, to do it. But I think that's kind of where he uh, is different than other authors and how he describes things. I agree. I think he's purposeful in what, in what he's doing. And I think he's trying to lead you by the nose without, without telling you. But I think that there's a lot of um, the same you know, like early on in Gardens of the Moon, there's a theme of futility and it's it's kind of, and even in Dead House Gates, you get some of that where there's, uh, you know, all these different races, but they're basically reliving these same struggles over and over with the same kind of uh, result over and over again. And so I think that part of the, the what seems like monotonous world building is actually point proving or point making that like, yo, look, these... Uh, you know, this isn't the first time that people have thought this way and then, you know, ended up doing the same kind of things. Okay. All right. Um, so let me, uh, we're, we're getting down. We're getting down. I promise we're getting there. Um, okay. So what about um, people who, uh, like, like me, um, feel, so for me, and again, I'm probably wrong, but let me, let me address this concern. After book six, I did not feel this way, books one through six, but starting with book seven, the books begin to feel bloated to me. Like, how many perspectives is too much? Does he include things like extra viewpoints and things that aren't really... Be, okay, so one of my main, one of my main, and this is in when, when I filmed my review for Dust of Dreams that isn't up, it's gonna sit on my camera forever. I said that like this, if this, if you cut out almost the entire middle of this book. This would be one of the best four or 500 page books I've ever read in my life. Like, because I mean, the serpent, like that has no context to anybody, but like, what? And there's, and Toll the Hounds, you know that, that I, what stuff I'm talking about in Toll the Hounds. Like, what do you say to the people who, who like me, who think that like, they start becoming a little a little big and we see this in, in other authors too the longer they write the books start getting bigger as if the editor stops working like martin like martin do we need to know what everybody ate in dance of dragons no we don't i don't need to know every time someone stopped to use the bathroom either like does that make sense what i'm trying to say yeah so caveat i love the later game of thrones books and like the dorn stuff so like this could gotcha. just be kind of my shit so that's okay. just one thing but i will say um I probably just lost all credibility with the people that are actually asking that question. <laughs> no one's listening anymore. Yeah, they totally to toned me out. Um, but I, what I will say is all of, I, I keep coming back to this, I think all of that is purposeful. And like sometimes, especially uh, like the Tist and D, like you're gonna feel bored with that, but I think that's how he's writing those because that's, that's like their problem as a people. I don't wanna say more about that, but like <laughs> also I can't say anything about the snake except to say that the end of that storyline made me weep while I read okay. it. So, it has some purpose though. Yeah, so yeah, it, it definitely has purpose, but even some like, even some storylines don't have purpose, except to say that there's no purpose to them, which is not satisfying, but I think is 
meaningful, if that makes sense. So I would, I would push back, I, I guess. I mean, I'm, okay. you know, I'm, I'm a stone cold lover of this series. And that's probably why, but I think everything is done in such an important way. And even again, in Crippled God, something that was my least favorite storyline from previous books, all of a sudden had like one of the best endings ever. And I'm not talking about the snake. I'm talking about another one. Um, so like, I think it continually surprises you, but also sometimes surprises you in that it's not important. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if that's kind of a non-answer, but that, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Re regarding the snake, I love everything you just said, Andy. Um, but for me, the snake actually has a purpose. And it is, again, going back to the, these themes of suffering. I mean, wow, can you imagine a better metaphor for suffering in the world? Then that, and I don't want to say any details because we're yeah. spoilers, but but that is a, just a, a, it's powerful, and I know why you wept because <laughs> it's that theme. It's about suffering and empathy. So uh, I don't think anything is in there without a purpose. I don't think Erickson would do that. So yeah, and I I I will jump in and and at the risk of of self sabotage, I will say there's like there is a an element of of the fan base who's like if you don't like this, you're stupid or we're the big brains and you're tiny brain kind of thing. Smooth brains, um, which I've I've gotten that vibe, and I I don't like it because not every piece of art is for every person, and I think I, Andy said it way more eloquently than I in his postmodernism uh, video, and I I, I think that. That's, that's totally fine. But what's so cool, and like, I would highly, highly recommend everybody to go out and read Erickson's essay about the snake and why we should read that, because it comes back like full circle to my point about this being a, a journey versus a destination story is that, you know, if you're the type of reader that you want to be told the story and you want to figure out what that climax is and, and then call it a day and move on to the next one, then yeah, this might not be for you. And I'm, I'm fine to, to say that I love Malazan, but that it might not be um, for, for everyone, but there is a, a purpose to this stuff. And it's, and it's, again, you know, goes back to the Deadhouse Gates themes of like, it's asking us to reflect and think and to recognize that this stuff is out there. And like his whole, he tie, you know, connects the dots of that and like Sudan and stuff like that. And like him mm -hmm. being an empathetic person and everything. And so I think it's, you know, that there's, you know, we're in a rush to, we're in, we're in book nine of a 10 book series and ready to find out when they throw the ring in the thing. Um, and he's saying, hey, look, there's this other stuff like happening that we still got to pay attention to. And I think that that's one of the beautiful parts of, of the book and also one of the things that's not going to work for everyone. I didn't know he wrote an essay on the snake in particular. Again, go look at it. It's the bomb. Honestly, I learned so much from it and I love the books more from reading it. And it, and it awesome. deals with the other really tough thing that happens in Dust of Dreams as well, um, which is a huge gotcha. spoiler, but it deals with that as well. Gotcha. And look, I love Deadhouse Gates. Like, I'm one of the few people that loves Deadhouse Gates more than Memories of Ice. Like, the chain of dogs, like Coltane. Oh, boy. Like, I love Coltane. It's ridiculous how much I like Coltane. Um, so, guys, you give such good answers. Like, you make me want to go read The Crippled God, like, right now. Like, I'm like I just want to, I just want to go read Crippled God. Um, okay, good. so. Go for it. I've got, like, I think I've got one more, and this is the – Let's try to talk about this without being um okay. So, what do we say about the okay? So, starting really with Memories of Ice, there is some kind of bizarre sexual violence that seems to increase in severity with every subsequent book, except maybe Midnight Tides. Like it's Children of the Dead Seed, weird, you, you know, Bitathol and and it, it, like, and then Reaper's Gale, like, like really, like let's let's not talk about Reaper's Gale, but I mean we all, I don't even understand it, it the reason it exists in Reaper's Gale, and then guys, I'm not I'm like I'm 100% serious, I almost put Dust of Dreams down, and I'd been with him the whole time, but in Dust of Dreams, it for me hit a point where I was like, I don't even understand the point of this other than trying to make me like angry and disgusted and like, and y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Um, 
so wh what do you say to 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 that? Because I'm not I'm not criticizing. Like I understand there's a place for that in 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 fantasy, and I do understand that that stuff that stuff does happen. But what do you say to if people think that it is in there for like, because when it came to Dust of Dreams, I honestly didn't, I didn't know what the purpose was. And because we saw some of that stuff, we saw some of the people involved in the third book and didn't hear anything about it in the third book. I was like, was this just invented just to make me uncomfortable in the ninth book? Does that make sense? Yeah. So that, uh, uh, portion in the ninth book, like I remember distinctly where I was when I read it. I had to put it down. I went out for a walk. Like I completely sympathize with that. I'll just answer very simply with how uh, Steven Erickson in that essay actually answers that question. His basic point is that it is not, it, it would, hmm, how, what's the best way to put this? Uh, it is not disrespectful. It would be disrespectful to people who experience those evils to not explore them in literature. And that's sort of his, his defense, so to speak, of that is to say that for us to be able to interact with that in the real world in a responsible way, because that does happen, we need to have that show up in our art. And it's not, you have to be careful how you do it, um, you know, and it's awful to read and it's in no way entertaining, but it serves an important function because that anger and frustration and sadness that you feel is really what people feel and what we should feel if we empathize with those people who actually do experience that. And so while thankfully many of us are not going to experience those things or have someone close to us experience those things, it's important that we empathize with people who unfortunately do suffer those. And so that's why it needs to be in the art that we read and consume. Um, and I think that's why he puts those in there. We can, we can argue specifically about particular cases you mentioned if that's done well or not well, but that was his purpose for, for doing that. Um, Philip, I know you have a great uh, video on uh, sexism in fantasy that you do a very good job in. So I, I wanna hear your thoughts on that question as well. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I think it would be very important to look at whether or not an author looks at the consequences of incidents, acts, violence of that sort. And I, I, you could take it on a case by, by case basis perhaps, but I think in general, Erickson definitely shows us the aftermath and shows us the consequences. And in some cases, um, you know, Carsa Orlong comes to mind, you know, for example. This is a character where you, he does some things that are just awful, and you see this character evolve and you see the consequences of those earlier actions and it's powerful. Uh, so I think it's very important to look at how it's done, uh, whether or not the consequences are portrayed, of course, whether or not this sort of thing is glorified at all. And I don't think Erickson glorifies it ever. Um, so yeah, that in brief is my response. Um, what do you think, Iskar? It's brutal stuff, you know, it's brutal stuff to, to read. And I think, again, it goes back to this, the, the kind of meta nature of the books where he's asking us to think and he's asking us to, um, to put ourselves in those shoes. And, and you know, it's, it's a terrible thing. It happens. And we've talked about it in our Discord a lot. And just, uh, you know, there's certain... Uh, elements even like drilling down within that that are um, just the individual behaviors in that kind of scenario that are at at issue and people criticize Erickson for the way he wrote it and stuff but I think that the the point was that and I think we're achieving his goal right now by sitting here and talking about it is that's what he wanted. He didn't want to tell us the answer. He wanted people to think about this stuff and to talk about it and to try and be aware of it. Those are such good points. Like, it's, I mean, if he wanted us to be uncomfortable, like, <laughs> like success, especially, 100%. especially in books seven and nine, seven and nine particularly. Um, and going, what you, what you said about Carsa, um, Philip, I mean, that goes back to talking about um, Erickson's character work. Like, if you think he doesn't do care, like Carsa, I think Carsa, you guys, again, I haven't finished the series, so you guys may disagree, but I think Carsa's his best. I, I, I think Carsa is his best, is, is just the fact that I, because Philip, I completely forgot until you just mentioned Carsa, I completely forgot that I am rooting for 
And like in my notes for Toll the Hounds, I was like, oh, oh, thank goodness. Like something's gonna happen. Carsa's shown up. Finally, the book can start, right? Like I root for Carsa. Mm -hmm. And then I remember <laughs> Mm. What a horrible, horrible man Carsa is. Not Just a horrible happen. man who's done horrible things. But, I mean, it says something that, like, I can root, like, I can root for Carsa despite him being really kind of despicable. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I think Erickson is on the record as saying, because he heard so much flack from people saying, oh, this guy can't write characters or whatever. I think Carsa, he's on the record as saying, is his basically showing, hey, I can do a character arc if I want to. That's not what I, my thing is here, but I can do this if I want, and here he is. And yeah, it's, it's the most complete character arc in the entire series, I think. And it's, I think, done brilliantly, and it's a very painful story, for sure, yeah. Well, cool. Um, I think I have, I think that's, I think that's it. I think we hit everything. Um, wow. Can I ask before you guys go, who's y'all's favorite Malazan character? Who's your favorite character in the Ooh. books? I'm going to, I'm going to go with, um, to hold Bedict as uh, my character. That's great. Although it's, it's a tough one for me because I really do. Everybody loves Anamander Rake, of course. Um, and, uh, but yeah, to hold is just, uh, He's he's awesome. He he uh such a brilliant character. Uh so yeah, that's my pick. Uh, he's great. Yeah. Um, it's got, oh Andy, sorry. Uh probably this is so hard. Uh probably Fiddler. Oh, good choice. Is it cuz he has a red beard? I mean, yeah. <laughs> Obviously, he's got the he's got the best. But no, I think it's interesting. I think I I don't know if this is true. I would imagine we have the most character perspective from Fiddler of any character. Do you guys know if that's true? I was thinking about this. I think he. I think it's true. I think he appears at least in the most books. Mm hmm. Um, because early on it's Perrin, but he basically disappears for two books, and I'm trying to think who else it would be. Yeah, he's a mainstay for sure. Yeah. He's got to be a number one. And he gets and he gets the bookends. I mean, he's a big part in the prologue. And, well, I guess the ending, you'll see. Yeah. Who's, Plus, who's Andy gets nominated for the, the most Fiddler vibes. He got nominated to play Fiddler in the adaptation in the Discord. So. Nice. Oh, I didn't know that. Excellent. Who's your favorite, Iskar? <laughs> I don't know. I gotta. I I think I gotta give it up for the duos. There's so many amazing duos. Whether it's to mm hold -hmm. bug or Stormy and Gessler, I, I I think I gotta be Team Stormy Gessler uh, because they they start in Deadhouse Gates and they carry through all the way to to the end. They hit the comedic vibes. They hit you in the feels. So yeah, I'm I'm Team Stormy Gessler. I'm gonna first of all, Philip. I'm gonna say. I don't like Anamanda Rake. Oh. Um, <laughs> Anamanda to me is the character I'm supposed to think is really awesome. He's like a cross between like Dritsto Erden and Sephiroth to me. And I'm just <laughs> like, I'm, I mean, I know that he's cool and I do think he's cool, but again, he's ponderous. Um, so like, I love, I love to hold like, that's the tonal dissonance with, <laughs> To hole and bug versus the versus the rest of the like. Do y'all see Pratchett like influences there? Oh, because so it feels so discworldy. Like just some of the dialogue between those two is brilliant. I love them. But if I'm not gonna say them, it's gonna be Kellenved and freaking Dancer. Like I love yeah. Kellenved and Dancer, and they're not even like you just hear about them, right? Like. This this is oh, I I love Kellenved and Dancer like the old emperor and his you know and his right hand I don't know why I love them so much but I freaking do so then you're gonna probably, love Path to Ascendancy go back and read yeah. the prequels that's you're why be into it. that's that's why I'm I'm so excited following uh, Philip's review of it I was like yes I love them so much um, so and there are no I'm, there are no Tice and D in Path to Ascendancy. I like the eater. They're they're my favorite. Um, if I got a pick of the you know of the the elves, pissed. Yeah. 
Um, and the Leo son, yeah. I have I have some questions to ask you guys, like once we're off camera, but uh, I think we're gonna wrap it up. Like, um, that's it. Um, I should say, sorry, real quick before we wrap up, I just thought of something else. Sorry, I'm scattered. Uh, one thing I would also say to someone who hasn't read it before, that might be a plus that I don't think I've seen in a lot of worlds. Um, the LGBTQ representation in Malazan mm. is incredible, especially considering that he started writing these in the 80s, um, like way ahead of the regular culture accepting these lifestyles. He has lifestyles that doesn't make a big deal about it, doesn't say much about it, um, you know, doesn't judge based on things, but there are lesbian couples, there's gay couples, there's uh, a very prominent bisexual soldier, and it's like well known, and like the fact that he did that, again, while he's writing this in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, when culture was nowhere close to that being an accepted thing, I think is fantastic and worth praising, and he doesn't get enough praise for in that respect. So I wanted to throw that in there as well. Yeah. There's also the, zero the, sexism. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah there's, the, there's tons of strong female characters too. Yeah. yeah. The relative absence of misogyny is, is pretty awesome in there. And that was a deliberate choice that Erickson and Esselmont made when they created the world. And it also, and it, the, the lack of that sexism allows when there is sexism to be very poignant and like very critical. Like, I mean, we talked about that. I mean, Carso is a great example of like when that's yeah. in your face all of a sudden after it hasn't been, it is so disgusting, which is what sexism should be all the time. But because of the world we live in, isn't necessarily. Plus, we get some of the most badass female characters in like all of fantasy. So that's, uh, that's just the bonus. Yep. Well, um, Guys, we're, we're hoping to actually, uh, once I get my act together, as Andy told me, and uh, read Crippled God, we're actually hoping to do another one of these um, where we kind of talk spoilers uh, for those of you who have finished the series. And um, we also might do one on Toll the Hound specifically because Erickson himself, uh, it, correct me if I'm wrong, said that, that it's the keystone, right? Toll the Hounds is the keystone to, the, to everything. Right. Yet it is the most hotly debated on whether it's a terrible book or whether it's the best, you know, the best of the series. And it's, it's um, Alan's favorite, if anyone out there didn't know. It is, my, it is my least favorite by <laughs> far. Like, but it's like, it's like not even on the same plane. Um, and hold on, is that, yeah, I think that's everything I want to say. Um, do you want to um, close us out, Iskar? No, I would just say thank you so much for watching. These guys are the bomb. It's a beautiful time to be alive in the Malazan booktube ecosystem with so much dynamic conversations happening at all different levels. I think that it's uh, an opportunity for us to get more folks into the book, to dispel myths, and to uh, and to just celebrate such a, a fun series. So I'm, I'm so happy to have... Uh, Again, been able to ride your guys' coattails. You're the bomb, and uh, I'm a huge fan of everyone here, and, and thank you so much for watching. You guys are brilliant. You guys are brilliant. This has been so, so, this has been really, really fun and really great. informative. Thanks for hosting us, Yuskar. Yep. Yeah.